Hello, I'm John Neff, Global Editor-in-Chief of Motor One, and welcome to Motor One This Week, the weekly podcast from Motor One. Uh, joining me today is Motor One Managing Editor, Brandon Turkis. How are you doing, Brandon? I'm doing very well, John. Awesome. And also with us today for the first time is the Community Manager for Motor One and Inside EVs, Dominic Yoni. How are you doing, Dom? Good. Nice to be here. Well, I invited both of you for a specific reason. You two uh, attended uh, an event this week called GM EV Days, and there was actually a lot happening and a lot was shown, particularly a lot of future vehicles that GM will be launching in the next two, three, even five years. And you weren't allowed to take cameras in, but you did see these vehicles with your eyes, uh, whether they were full size vehicles or just clay models, you guys actually know what uh, all of these future vehicles will look like. So I wanted to get you on the podcast to talk about them and maybe you can describe some of these vehicles um, that the rest of us aren't gonna see for a long time. Um, but before we get into the vehicles, I think the 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 fundamental piece of news uh, out of uh, GM about their electric plans are their new batteries. Um, so yesterday or the day before, they announced this new battery technology. They've given it a marketing name. They're calling it the Ultium, the Ultium batteries. And so this is going to power their next generation of electric vehicles. And I'll give you I'll give you the rundown of some specs and why they're uh, the advancements they've made. Uh, for one thing, this is a, a pouch style battery, which uh, in case everyone doesn't know, batteries can come in lots of different shapes. Um, for instance, the Tesla batteries are all little cells. They look like little cylinders, little, you know, double A batteries. Um, but GM uses pouch style batteries, um, which are almost like, you know, Ziploc bags, um, that are, that are pressed together. Uh, the advancement here is that normally those pouch style batteries had to be lined up in a way that they were standing up, but GM's Ultium batteries, they can be, they can be stacked on their side, which allows a lot more, um, opportunity to package them in different ways in a car, which is a good thing. Um, also GM says they use a minimum amount of cobalt, which that's important because cobalt is a really nasty, uh, thing to mine. It's in high demand. So the, the less of it an automaker can use, the better for everybody. Um, and then in terms of the specs of the batteries, um, GM says they will, uh, put them together in packs ranging from 50 to 200 kilowatts, uh, which is a pretty impressive spread. I mean, to give you an example, um, I have uh, actually Dom and I both have Chevy Spark EVs, and they have <laughs> they have 20 kilowatt uh, batteries. So that's less than half of what the smallest battery pack of the Ultiums will be. Um, I also have a, a Model Three that has I think like a 60 or 70 kilowatt battery. Uh, the Tesla Model S Long Range has about uh, a little under 100 kilowatt. So this is right now twice the largest battery that Tesla currently offers uh, when these Ultiums come out. Um, they also will, in addition to being able to charge on uh, level two and DC fast charge, they'll have 800, uh, there'll be 800 volts, which is another new technology that only Porsche has right now in the Taycan. Um, so it'll be able to charge uh, up to 350 kilowatts, just like the Taycan. So some very, very fast charging. So yeah, these sound like great specs. Uh, it really sets up GM for this kind of onslaught of EVs they're going to have in the next few years. Every other manufacturer also isn't sitting on their hands. Tesla is going to have its own battery day next month where we'll find out, you know, what the next three to five years of Tesla batteries look like. Um, so, but I think the Altium is a really great start for GM. Uh, what do you think, Dom? Because you've, you've followed uh, all this battery tech across the industry. This battery really underpins GM's entire electric vehicle strategy. They're all the same size and they can be fit in the modules and those modules can be put into different packs or different sizes, but this allows them to use the same cell for many different vehicles, which gives them scale so they can make a lot of these cells and bring the price down. And price is really fundamental to everything. So whereas like the, the Bolt battery now is like $145 per kilowatt hour. Per kilowatt hour, yeah. Uh, with this, this new battery will be 
at a, we'll start at $100 per kilowatt hour to start, and then it'll, it'll keep going down from there. And that's the magic number that I always hear is $100 per kilowatt hour, that when batteries get to that number, they will basically be on par with the cost of internal combustion engine cars in terms of the cost they add to the to the vehicle. Um, so that's Correct. a big number. And, and, and I know Tesla and other automakers are, are trying to figure out how to either get the cost down or get the economies of scale up in order to get their battery production to reach $100 per kilowatt hour. And GM is saying we're a giant company. Um, we, can, we can create that uh, huge economy of scale to get that uh, $100 per kilowatt hour. I, b I believe Tesla may be there already, actually, but but that's not the end. That's not the end of the road for GM. Uh, speaking with uh, Mark Rose, the president of GM, was speaking with us in January, and he said they expect that the prices continue going down from there, and they, and they can't even see the bottom of where, where right. that price bottoms out. So well, and that's because you know the the trajectory of EVs in the market is only going to go up, right? And I don't think anyone knows where the the peak is, if it's going to peak at, you know, 20% of sales, or if it's if it is eventually going to gobble up the entire industry, and we're going to have an industry that's 90% EVs and 10%, um, you know, uh, fuel powered or um, internal combustion engines. So yeah, I mean, there really is no floor if, if we keep making more and more of these. The price there that or the scale that affects the price as as the like, like Tesla, they're doing continual de development on their battery cells. So like this, this 2020 Bolt has a, uh, is a little bit better than the, in the batteries in the, in the cells in the uh, 2019 Bolt. And then again, the, the new Altium cells are, have 60% more energy than the, the Bolt cells. And then they have in development uh, a cell that is double the Altium. Jeez. Every generation of these batteries are going to get better and better in terms of energy density, but also cost. Um, and it's ha it's happening now. It's happening quickly. It seemed like it was going so slowly for a while, but now that so many automakers have committed to electric vehicles in their lineup in the future, just so much R and D money is going into it. I want to move on though and talk about the vehicles the Altium batteries are going to power. Uh, and Brandon, let's start with the one that is going to be unveiled first, which is the Cadillac Lyric. Tell us about that one. So the Lyric is, it's a very interesting vehicle for a number of reasons, not least of all because it's the first all electric Cadillac. But I want to talk first about the design because it's, it's going to be a polarizing piece of design. Uh, this is one of the only vehicles at the, at the event that looked fully formed. There were still some concept car elements to it but overall the design is according to gm 95 percent final so what we saw is very likely what will roll across the stage in new york when it makes its auto show debut and this is uh this is a crossover can you tell us the the like the size compare the size to something we would know so the size the size is difficult to judge because it, you know it was parked next to the absolutely enormous Celestic and a midsize Chevy crossover. Cadillac told me that it will slot in more or less where the XT5 currently sits, but because of the advantages that come with having a battery electric powertrain, it will be much more roomy. Mm -hmm. uh, overall, in terms of size, if I had to compare it to something, I'd say it reminds me of a bit of a, a Range Rover Velar, both in terms of size and the profile. It's it's a long vehicle, but it's low and wide and very sporty, very sporty looking. But like I said, the design will be polarizing, especially behind the uh, C pillar. Behind the C pillar, really? So like the the rear part of the roof and going into the into the back hatch. Yeah, it's it's very interesting what what Cadillac has done. They it, it that section is very large there's a ton of visual mass back there your your eyes are drawn to it immediately but they've integrated these really really beautiful led taillights that are split between the upper half of the car and the bottom half and it, it's it's difficult to describe but they're they're going to be one of the most eye-catching pieces of this car on um, which is saying something because the rest of the car is very eye-catching well, functionally, does that do, does what's behind the C pillar? Does that increase the amount of utility for the car, like the cargo space, or decrease it? Like, is it compromising or is it helpful? I don't think it. No, I don't think it has any any significant impact. It, there's okay. still a rather roomy cargo hold back there, but it definitely seems like there's more space dedicated to passengers than to cargo. 
Okay. Did they give you any other information about the lyric in terms of specs? Uh, no, particularly, they were, you know, tight lipped about everything. Yeah, it was. I mean, Don, Don will say the same thing. Cadillac and and the rest of the GMPR people that were there, and the engineers and designers and all the other subject matter experts were. They they really stuck to their script, and I have. It seemed like ev- they prepared for every question you could possibly yeah. have. What about so, the interior? Did, did did they open it up and let you see inside? Yeah, so the interior they didn't open it up, or they might have opened it up. Um, either way, it was it's still technically a concept car, so we weren't all allowed to get it, allowed to get in and crawl around it. But mm-hmm. it had the large glass uh, cockpit design from the Escalade, which means a giant thirty inch. Uh, display that spans most of the dash. There's a, there were displays in the front headrests for the rear seat passengers, and there was also mm-hmm. a center console touchscreen for the rear seat passengers. It was laid out as a two plus two, so the car that we see will be a two plus two, but they will also offer it with a, a three across bench. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so, you know, obviously whenever we talk about electric cars, range is always the first spec we want to know, but it sounds like, uh, perhaps Cadillac is, is learning a bit from Porsche, which is, you know, don't make promises, uh, that, you know, you can't keep wait until you figure out exactly what the number is going to be, uh, and that you hit the number you want. Um, hopefully maybe they'll, they'll announce range when we get, uh, when they debut it, but I could also see them waiting even longer it, after that. It- it certainly sounds like what we're going to see in April when the car the car is set to debut on April second in L.A. before making the trek to uh, New York City for the New York International Auto Show. It definitely sounds like what we're going to see. And it was described to me by a GM designer as not a concept car but a precursor. So mm-hmm. it sounds more like we're going to see, what we're going to see is a m- almost entirely finalized design, kind of like a ninety ninety five percent there design. Yeah, it's it, it. This is this is the thing that Honda does. They they did it with the uh, you know there were like a dozen. It was NSX prototype, Civic Type right. R prototype, Acura Type S prototype, and they were all very very thinly disguised production cars. But in terms of what they told us about the mechanicals, there was very little information. It was more just here's our car, here's what we're doing. Be excited for it. Right, right. Let's move on to the to the Cadillac you mentioned that was parked next to the Lyric. And and uh, correct me if I'm pronouncing this wrong, Dom. It's the Celestic. Celestic, yes. So tell us about that because that was a, a surprise, I think. So so like Brian said, it, it was it's huge. It's uh, uh, lower than a, than a crossover, obviously, but it was uh, you know pretty wide. Also very long. The fascia was very similar to the to the Lyric like almost identical to the Lyric from like below the top of the hood down. Uh, there was maybe a small difference where the air intake comes in just below the, it has like a glass front, like you can see on the Lyric uh, teaser images. So it has that same and, glass. And this is, this is a, a four door, kind of like a sedan, but it has a rear hatch. A huge rear hatch. Yes. It's uh, four doors and the, the back seats are very executive uh, amount of space in, in front. You could, you could lay out. <laughs> In, in I mean, without the space, this sounds to me like a a halo car. I mean, this doesn't sound like anything. We we hadn't heard of Cadillac developing this, so to me, it's a, a surprise. Um, but I mean, this sounds like something that's going to be, if 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 not um, if not a six figure car, like that could get there with options so, because it sounds this you know, will just huge. easily. Six I would, I'd bet money it's easily going to be six figures. There's wow. no questioning about it. It's it's going to be a hand-built limited run car. I think, uh, did they mention anything to you about production? I, f- I feel like I heard something about only 500 units, Dom. I, I didn't hear a number, no. I, I might I might have been mishearing that, but it's, it's but entirely, oh, so it, definitely so it is entirely hand-built. Wow, wow. I mean, it's kind of reminding me of what Lucid is doing, where they decided that their electric car is going to be this kind of giant two plus two executive fairing car that has incredible range and, and performance. But, but yeah, it's just very limited edition and, and, and it's going to be extremely expensive. Um, yeah, I didn't see Cadillac. I, I, I didn't expect Cadillac to go that way. So I'm very, it does, again, it comes down to specs too. Like I'm very interested, like, are they going to go for 400 mile range or right off the bat? It or? does. It does kind of worry me though, because Cadillac is, 
such a long history of we're going to do a flagship sedan and it's going to be awesome and it's going to be the standard of the world again and something or other happens and the idea is just abandoned i almost or wish that, well they were... they, ca- they cancel it or compromise it right right I, feel like... I, I almost i almost wish that they were that they were go- focusing their efforts more not on the celestic but on expanding its lineup of ev crossovers and coming out with like a, a really killer flagship ev crossover we've criticized cadillac time and again for focusing on sedans when they should be focusing on crossovers and i kind of agree like they need to get their house in order first before they create a six-figure halo ev sedan like that seems not a like part of the fundamental business model that they should be focusing on so i bet you if if any of the vehicles we talk about today on the podcast could be cut uh if needed it would be this one uh, yeah, because I, it's, I, it's it seems superfluous a little bit, just like a vanity exercise. I put odds of this being built at less than fifty fifty. That's just yeah. my my personal take. I I could be, I hope I'm wrong. Yeah. All right. Well, we'd love to hear uh, what you all think about the two Cadillacs we've talked about. Uh, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter at MotorOne.com, where the discussion will continue. And of course, on our website, where we've written about each of these cars, and we've already got tons of comments on them. You can find us there. We'll, we'll respond. Uh, I also want to give you a reminder that you can get our show on Apple Podcasts. Google Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts. So please hit the subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. All right, welcome back. I want to move on next to a vehicle we already know about, the Hummer. Well, let me, uh, pardon me, the GMC Hummer EV. So they had that at this event as well, and we learned some more details. So Brandon, why don't you run us through some of the new things we learned? Yeah, so they, unlike the Lyric and the Celestic, and kind of worryingly, in my opinion, these were just clay models. They were they were fully sized, like they were two scale, painted, had their detailing, but they are just shells of cars. And they cattle or GM kind of surprised us right off the bat because they had both the Hummer truck, which we've been expecting. We knew it was going to be a traditional pickup truck, and the Hummer SUV, which we didn't know was coming. This isn't really unusual for the Hummer brand. If you look back to the H2 and the H3, there were SUVs and SUTs, which is what they're calling the new truck. It's the GMC Hummer EV SUT, oh uh, which is so they're. Oh, I mean, they're they're going all in on the Hummer branding. I mean, they're resurrecting the Hummer, uh, you know, names and the 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 model uh, names, the SUT and the SUV. Yep. All right. So so, vis- so visually quite similar too. Yeah. So w- w- what did they look like, Brandon? I mean, like, you, so you've I mean, seen them. We've we've tried to render them, but they were just complete guesses out of the dark. The, so what do they look the, like? Well, we've seen the front. I mean, we we know what the what the grill and the fascia are going to look like, and that's you know that's very much the case. The thing that struck me about them is they weren't nearly as big as I was expecting. I was kind of expecting you know big half ton or I'm sorry one ton pickup trucks, you know HD size trucks and. They didn't really feel like that. They they reminded me more of a standard GMC Sierra fifteen hundred, but chunkier and a little bit shorter and a little bit taller. The section on the truck right before the bed had a little bit of a, a Chevrolet Avalanche vibe to it, with the way that the body cuts down into the bed. It's it's an interesting shape, and I'm I'm curious to see how it looks on the actual production car. Because it, you know, on a clay model, you don't get an idea of textures really. You just have colors. I'm actually surprised they were clay models because I remember GM executives saying that this might be the first electric pickup truck to market, and it seems like if they don't I, have a I real asked, one built, I asked about that, and I, you know, I said to one of their designers, "You guys are supposed to be showing this car in two months. You know, I understand that you're showing the Lyric in a month, and we have a." a broadly functional concept but it's it should we read into anything about this being a clay model and they kind of brushed it off but i i think it's at the very least surprising that we're this close to the goal line and we're still and seeing clay models of these vehicles clay models. Yeah, I, don't now, think have, um, I don't think they have the concept quite finished yet yeah that wow. that that would be the only thing that would make sense to me but at that at that point why wouldn't you just delay the event until the, the concept is finished yeah, why it would, seems strange to show you something that may change. 
Yeah, exactly. It's it you know, it was odd, but that said they did have you know, some of the detailing was done. I think the the headlights and the grill on the Hummer are going to be really impressive. I think the SUV will be the volume model. I don't think I think they'll move the SUT, but it'll be a lot like with the H three where that was that was the the anomaly and the SUV was the volume player. What I did want to talk about was the cabin, which they had they had a mock up yeah. of it mounted behind the behind the cars and it was just the front seats and the dash, but it is a genuinely pretty brutish uh powerful cabin design it's got all the chunkiness and and military like foam military kind of ruggedness utility yeah, yeah that you expect like- from a hummer but then there are little touches like i don't remember someone told me this and i i i it clicked the the speaker grills have a pattern that's the sea of tranquility from the moon on them like it's just it's kind of a Jeez. bonkers cabin with like these orange uh, anodized accents, and it's it's really wild. They call it lunar themed. Yes, a lunar, a lunar themed. themed. It's, it's it's honestly yeah, the the talking point about this car when it debuts will not necessarily be about the the electric powertrain, but it's going to be about the cabin. The cabin is wild. That's cool. That's cool. They have to be. I, I think it's important for these EVs that are entering the market and introducing kind of this new powertrain and, and way of transport to have some level of innovation or or even polarization. Just I've, you guys have heard me say you that, have to gen, you have to generate a reaction, good or ne- good or bad. You just can't be boring. That's what it seems like is going on. At, at least with the Lyric and the Celestic and the Hummers, it seems like GM understands that because it, I mean I've. I've never seen the company go all in on new concept like this. Usually they're compromised in some dramatic way and these don't feel like that. So um, the the Hummer strategy then, if they're going to have both a truck and an SUV, seems very similar to Rivian's strategy because Rivian also has a truck and an SUV that are similar in that they're you know they're exactly the same design. Just one one is an SUV in the back and one has a bed. Um, so I find it very interesting that that GM kind of decided to target that model, go head to head with Rivian, and of course Ford is an investor in Rivian, so that makes it even a little more interesting. Um, and then also this this Hummer platform, so it's going to be a Hummer truck, a Hummer SUV, and then they also announced that the platform will underpin a Cadillac SUV that will be all electric and Escalade sized. So we're going to have basically an Escalade sized um, electric SUV. And with this new battery, these these larger vehicles are going to have the 200 kilowatt battery packs, which means they're going to be the ones that are probably capable of up to 400 miles They'll because they can carry the largest size battery packs. Um, so I find these kind of the most exciting um, of the whole bunch. Yeah, the, the Cadillac one, I, I got the impression just from walking around the Cadillac truck or SUV that was there that it's the furthest back on the development path. Uh, yeah. One of the things they said about the Celestic and the Lyric is that this will be the new face of Cadillac EVs. All the Cadillac EVs will have this face. And by and large, the the Cadillac SUV just kind of looked like an Escalade. Really? Uh, that's, that's not a bad thing, but I... Yeah. If you were walking into it, if you walked into the, the design dome where they held this event yesterday and looked at the Celestic, the Lyric, and this this Cadillac SUV concept. I don't want to call it an Escalade. It it looks like a damn Escalade, though. Really? You you would you, know, you would you would not be able to guess that. Oh, that one's going to be electric too. Maybe though. You know, I don't think Cadillac is or GM in general is going to kind of tip their hat on what they think the next five to fifteen years is going to be like, but. They could be seeing, uh, like, like I said, a future where where the industry is seventy five to ninety percent EV, and where and you know the minority being gas electric. They could be envisioning a day where the Escalade itself gets replaced by an EV that's called the Escalade, or the Escalade just becomes. I, I, electric. Honestly, that was that was a thought that I had in the back of my head, and it would be interesting if they took that path because the Escalade, the current generation Escalade, isn't even out yet. So, right. but I think I think that's entirely plausible. I think that at some point, it might be three or four years from now that we see a concept of the next generation Escalade that is based on this vehicle and based on this uh, new electric platform and battery architecture and all that stuff, and that it ends up foreshadowing 
the the next generation Escalade. That's that's probably seven eight years from production right now though. So and maybe I, they, they want to wait. They want to wait and see how the market shakes out, how fast yeah, people adopt EVs, and you know, it's, so a lot of it's, variables. It's a, there, there's yeah. there are a lot of moving pieces, and but but the thing is, GM's GM's EV strategy is very very aggressive. I mean, to go to an event where they show you ten all electric cars that they're planning to bring to market for four brands is, I mean, that's a level of aggression. It about or aggression towards a new a goal, type of technology yeah. that we've never seen from from any automaker really. You know, after the last, you know, couple years when we had all of the automakers announce, just just make announcements, issue press releases that, you know, X percent of their lineup is going to be electrified by, you know, three or four years. This year, we're actually starting to see some tangible evidence of those efforts. And I think, you know, you look at Ford and giving the Mustang name and branding to the Mach-E, that was huge. That was, to me, that was like an aggressive thing. And of course, they have their own battery plans outside of that um, with the electric F-150 and other vehicles. And you're right, this, this is GM's this is GM's power move, right? They they put it all in, and this is they're showing us exactly how far they're going, and it's incredibly far. They're looking at 2030 and realizing that's that's just 10 years, and they have to move aggressively to become a majority EV uh, company by 2030. I think that's really what they have yeah. their eyes on. It's it's really interesting. I think we're going to see, especially with vehicles that are coming out, gas powered vehicles that are coming out in the next year or two are going to have very truncated life cycles. I don't think we're going to be seeing, you know, the days where a gas powered vehicle sticks around for eight or nine years are are on their way out. I, I think it's going to, the next few years we'll see, you know, four or five year life cycles for for a lot of products. Yeah, as, as this switchover kind of happens. So the last, I, I did want to talk about one more uh, vehicle or two vehicles, and that's the Bolt and the Bolt crossover that's coming. Uh, because, I mean, we should give the Bolt credit because it was one of the first long range electric vehicles uh, that came out, uh, you know, like plus 200 miles. It is a it is a good car. They've, they've updated it and increased its range. Um, and it's never really gotten its due. And I think that's because because like we were talking about before, where it's it seems like the good strategy is to have an electric vehicle that causes a reaction. The Bolt really doesn't cause a reaction. It's very kind of vanilla in in, in, in a sea of, of kind of um, exciting electric vehicles around it. But uh, they are coming out with a next generation EV. Uh, that's going to come later this year. And they did announce that um, the Bolt uh, based crossover will come mid next year and did you guys get to see those as well they're both there side by side well if, if you go to motor1.com and we have a story up called refresh chevy bolt tv coming late 2020 bolt electric crossover mid 2021 the bolt electric crossover that's called the bolt euv and it's uh, just slightly larger it's got like a three inch longer wheelbase and five inches longer overall sitting side by side they look they look very similar in size, actually, but they look so much better than the current Chevy Bolt EV. Like more interesting, like people will, you know, have a reaction I, to them. I don't know. I don't know about that. I think the the exterior design is still rather subdued, but the two cars, I mean, they share the same fascia. Like there will be no mistaking the Bolt EUV for anything but a Bolt. Now, did they did they talk about specs for this one, like range? Because these cars will not have the Ultium batteries. These are like the last cars GM, last EVs GM will build without the the new Ultium batteries. As far as we know, the, this will still have the same 259 mile range as the current Bolt, and I imagine the EUV could be a little bit less than that since it's yeah, larger because of weight and heavier. Yeah. One yeah. of the things they mentioned to to me was that last year was the year for batteries this year is the year for interior refinements so that that ah, kind of okay. says to me that they you know we won't be seeing additional power or additional range from from the bolt from the 2021 bolt but if you sit in this bolt you, the interior is it's night and day from the first one when the, i almost bought a bolt last summer i got i got in it sit down and i looked around and there was all this plastic and i said i this is not a $38,000 car, you know, it just, how can you, 
uh, I, I just couldn't see myself paying that much money for this guy, that kind of uh, experience. But I get in this car, and uh, it's, it's it is like night and day. It's so much nicer, soft much soft touch materials everywhere. A nice like leather like dash. Um, this will also come with Super Cruise. It'll be the first one with Super Cruise. Although the the ones on display yesterday didn't have that Super Cruise steering wheel or, or the little camera. Should should clarify it. It will be available with Super Cruise. It will not come right. with Super Cruise. It and that's only on. the EUV, the standard Bolt. I don't think the standard Bolt gets it. Uh, that's a good point. Yeah, so this is the first car outside of Cadillac that will get the Super Cruise system, right? Yeah, so, and it's the first of many. Right. First of many. Okay. There's like um, a 2022 vehicles by 2023 will have Super Cruise and then 10 more the following year. You know, you mentioned the price. And one thing to point out about GM's future EV plans that I think is important and not talked about a lot is that they have started their wind down of being eligible for the federal rebate. So uh, they have sold enough EVs now because they've been selling bolts uh, for a while and and even uh, volts, I think, counted towards this. Uh, that they've reached a, a number of sales where the $7,500 federal tax rebate has shrunk to, you know, $3,7500. And I think if I think by the end of this month, uh, March, at the end of March 2020, um, it will end completely. Right now it's at its lowest amount, which is eighteen seventy five. So that's actually a big thing. Tesla has already, I think, completely lost its rebate. Um, and I think GM is the the next behind them to completely lose the rebate. Whereas other manufacturers like Ford and and all these other ones still have the seventy five hundred dollars to factor into kind of the final price when they're selling these vehicles. So GM, that's a that's a challenge for GM. Um, you know, it was kind of a disadvantage of having gotten in the game as early as they did because they were just using those kind of sale credits uh, for the rebate. It is, it is interesting. I don't know if this is just because of where I live in Detroit, but looking at the, the Chevy website, they are doing $8,500 in cash allowance on the Bolt. So I almost kind of wonder if GM is trying to make up for that out of its own pocket. But I, yeah, I don't know. but that probably, but that then that's GM paying for that incentive, exactly. Not the federal that's government not, and yeah, not a eating good away, at the, yeah, eating away at the profits. I, uh, I don't even, I don't think they're profitable when they sell them at pr- full price. So no, I don't think yeah. so. You, you can score a good deal on a on a Chevy Bolt EV right now. It's like twenty five thousand dollars for the low end LP. Yeah. Or uh, I heard I'm somebody trying, yesterday that's what I'm trying to do <laughs> twenty twenty seven for a premium. Uh, it's like even even without the uh, government incentive, that's a great deal. For sure. That's why I said it's it's an underappreciated electric vehicle, I think, um, you know, especially compared to the Leaf. Uh, you, you can't get the new long range Leaf for uh, that little. Um, I, yeah, I'm a I'm a I'm a Bolt supporter. Uh, like I said, I don't think it's given it. It's gotten its due. Well, I want to thank you guys for um, sharing what you saw at the GM EV days. They took your cameras, so we couldn't share anything with readers. Uh, but you guys describing this stuff has helped me, you know, at least least paint a mental image until we see the first vehicle the lyric at the new york auto show next month so thank you guys for joining me today thank you thank you and and you can find brandon turkis on twitter at brandon turkis uh you can find dom at dominic underscore y uh you can find me on twitter at john underscore m underscore neff and i want to thank all of you out there for listening we'll see you next week